Today, I have a super special guest joining me. Love this guy. I've been following him on LinkedIn for quite some time. And finally, he made it to the show. Jordan West, podcast host, e-commerce business owner, agency owner, mountain bike rider. Congratulations on, I think it's episode number 560 that launched today, I believe. Amazing. Feat. That's right. Anyway, that's thanks for joining me on the show. Appreciate it. Absolutely. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it just kind of keeps going and going. I think at this time, at this point, like with the amount of numbers that it actually is, it's just like, all right, well, we're going to hit a thousand at some point here. So <laughs> that is amazing. 560. I'm sure, um, over the years, you've probably formulated some framework, you know, towards it, because I know in the beginning, it's quite, you know, challenging with all the logistics around it, getting, you know, communicating, aligning with your guests and topics. And so what a good achievement. It's, it's one of those things that like, once you start doing it, you realize, you know, what actually works, what doesn't. Um, I have a team behind me. I have, uh, you know, every single episode is usually sponsored. So we have the, the finances sure. to be able to do all of that kind of stuff. But for me, it used to be like, Hey, you know, we're going to talk about these specific sort of things. Um, and now it's more like jazz, right? Where like, you know the notes, and so you can just kind of play within them. And I have great guests on um, at all times. I'm probably going to have a, a Shark Tank uh, person on here pretty soon too um, to chat. Um, so some, yeah, some pretty cool, cool. some pretty cool guests uh, that I've been able to have over the years, and really, really enjoy doing that. So great oh, to be on here. Um, and then, yeah, thanks so much for inviting me. Absolutely, absolutely. Can't wait to tap into some of your knowledge and your insights. Um, I think you've got a lot, you're already sharing so much with the community, you know, for, for you to coming on the show, sharing your insights on what we're going to be discussing is pretty cool. So on that note, um, I'm going to deep dive into some of these topics. We're going to be covering two topics today. And again, feel free to lay it on the table here. I know you are someone that love to be, you, you love to kind of spill, spill the guts here, be super honest about things. You don't hold back. Your recent Send Lane versus Clavio conversation. Beautiful podcast. The first topic I want to unpack and I want to learn more from you is, is this, this issue I'm seeing within many accounts, uh, e-commerce accounts that we audit, of, of course, on a weekly, daily basis. That is the, the problem of, because we're in the email, SMA space, retention marketing, I think we play in a similar space anyways. Is this notion of we can't control the the touch points, the the stages of you know customers throughout your buying journey? So what ends up happening is because no one has a great finger or pulse on it, we just throw everything at them: SMS messages, email messages. The touch points are just wild. Um, we sometimes see accounts where um, a cart abandonment flow would have four or five emails two SMS touch points. So if someone triggers that, they will receive five to six emails in a space of two days and two SMS. And then they also trigger post-purchase flow. It's just bonkers. So I wanna uncover that a bit. Um, messaging overload. What have you seen in the past? What are you currently seeing? What's working, what's not working from your point of view? Yeah, that's a really, really interesting question. Thanks for bringing that up because there's actually the opposite side of things, right? So there's a lot of brands who are like, you know, I, especially the, the kind of brands that we grew up with around us and, um, and, uh, you know, the, the brand that my wife started and ended up scaling, you know, fairly, fairly big. The issue for a lot of people is I don't want to send very many messages, right? So like, oh, I'll just send when I have to. So they'll send maybe, you know, one message a week or maybe one every two weeks. That to me is a much bigger issue than not than sending every day. I'd always err on the side of sending more because of deliverability, right? If you're not sending enough messages, you're not going to, number one, people are going to forget about you. You're not that special. You know, your brand is not that special that people are like waiting for that, uh, you know, message like, ah, oh, when are they going to email? No, 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 no. You need to stay top of mind. If people don't want to, um, don't want to hear from you, Make it explicit on how to unsubscribe. So interesting, I uh, I just got my newsletter up and running uh, in a big sort of way. Um, my my personal newsletter, and I'll just tell this anecdote quickly here. I uh, in in the newsletter, 
uh, at the very beginning, every single time say, hey, if this is not a value, please unsubscribe. I don't want you receiving this message every day. And so lo and behold, on the first couple, I had about 300 unsubscribes. Um, the list is still about 10,000 people, which I think, you know, in our space is pretty good. But now that open rate, the click-through rate, everything is great because I don't want to be sending to people who don't want to hear from me anyway, right? Like, that's, and that's why I don't understand services like retention.com because I, I'm like, yeah, you're, and, and, you know, we're, we're both saying this from places that you probably can't use the tactics of retention.com because feeding those emails back into people who don't want to hear about you makes no sense. Like these people don't want to hear from you. Why are you overloading them with messages? Instead, make sure like people don't need, first of all, people don't need to be reminded four times about their abandoned cart, right? I don't think that they need to be reminded four times. Do they need a, a nudge here and there? Absolutely. I think that that can be done in better ways than just constant abandoned cart flows. Um, I think that that's where marketing in general comes in, right? That's why always making sure that you're running um, uh, ads on multiple platforms at, is incredibly important. I don't recommend running like pure retargeting these days just because the, the uh, platforms are going to do that for you. But making sure that you show up everywhere, I can tell you anecdotally, like I have made so many purchases by just continually seeing that brand in my, uh, you know, whether it's in my inbox, whether it's on Meta or wh wherever it is. And I think that that's really important. I just want to just, just one more small point here. How many times do you make a purchase? I think that, I think that brands sometimes think, or people out in the e-com space think, that because I optimize for a one day click, one day view conversion, that somehow a person actually converts in one day. Imagine having a product that somebody just saw for the first time and then just grabbed it. That's called junk. That's the dollar store, right? So if people are doing that, you probably have a dollar store product. It doesn't mean you're a good marketer. People are gonna take a lot of time to check out your product and convert. If you have any AOV like above a hundred bucks, when's the last time that you've just like suddenly made a flash purchase? I've never done that before. I don't, that's, that's not a thing that happens. And that's why post-purchase surveys are so helpful to see, hey, how long have you known about us for? I think about, let's talk about our baby clothing brand. People generally knew about us an average of 37 days before they'd purchase. Yeah. Well, that's not gonna show up in a pixel. That's not gonna show up in tracking. And so it's really important that, yes, that you have that, hard hitting, you know, abandoned cart, but, but it's so much more than that. It's so much more than an abandoned cart, right? It's more like, why am I purchasing this rather than some cheap junk on Amazon? Right? Like there's a, like you need to differentiate that. And those are the things that I like to, to go into. I like to go into reviews. I like to go into the why behind the product, maybe some video, maybe a personalized video. There's so many really cool ways. So sorry, I've monologued here for a while, but I just wanted to make sure to get those points out. On that topic, should we talk about attribution modeling? No, let's not talk about attribution. <laughs> okay, so- well, I mean, we I mean, could, uh, we could. <laughs> let's not, we've got a time cap here. Um, That's right. I think you've, look, I think you've covered so many good points here and I'm gonna kind of touch on some of them. I like how you've reversed my question and and you've you've attacked it from an angle of you potentially under sending. Um, that's a very interesting question. And we we also see that dilemma. Um, not saying that, of course, you should just all of a sudden just ramp it up and go wild. But I like how you also highlighted some tactics that you are enabling within the system of messaging overload give people option to to opt out like you say um like frequency select your frequency how often do you want to see emails from us give people the the options to you know select how, their preference how do you want to yeah. receive emails from us i love that and then also how you mentioned deliverability i mean Nowadays, you can monitor those performances. If you see certain spikes in certain things, you know there's a potential signal of, dude, you're doing it wrong. But if you don't yeah. hit those, those snags and issues, you need to be in front of people. And, and I get what you're saying is, you don't wanna be fading in someone's inbox and let your competitor brands be the ones sending emails every day. You also wanna to be top of mind. So I think you, you cover so many good parts you know, of this conversation. Mm. Thank you. I mean, I think that there's just a lot to think about as a brand owner. It's not just a matter of, you know, 
being like, how many emails do I send? It's like, well, why are you sending them? What are you sending them for? What's the point of that email? Is the point just to get someone to convert? Because we all know what it's like being in a, 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 I don't know if you've ever been to Mexico. Mexico is just a good example of this, where like everywhere you go, it's like, buy, 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 buy from me, buy from me, buy from me. And it's like, oh, yeah. you just get annoyed with that after a while, because that's not actually what you want to do with a brand, right? If, if, if that's the case, just go to Amazon. Just go be an Amazon brand. That's a buy from me place. And that's fine. That's the point of it. That's not what you're doing in D2C land. You're building a brand, which is much different, right? Than just selling a product. There are two completely different things. So, so on, on that point, so of course we want to make it, there is no black and white to this, but we want to be pragmatic about this. Is there a science to this? To this is there a framework that someone can apply to messaging touch points planning it out or do you feel like it is still a, a bit of a feel I, I feel like four emails because you mentioned that should someone receive four you know quarter abandoned emails no uh, how much is needed then like like what is that number what is that framework is there something or you believe there's no science behind it so I'm sure that there is a framework. Do I have one? Uh, no, no, I, I, I don't have one for that. What I think it comes down to is actually thinking about the customer journey. So I, I am all about frameworks. I mean, if, if anyone's followed me online for any time, I just have framework upon framework that I love to give to people. But I think that sometimes it's not necessarily a mathematical equation, right? It's, it's let's think about where this fits in the actual customer journey and how we go from somebody not knowing anything about us, not even having awareness to us, to actually becoming a raving fan. And there's a lot of steps in between. And if you go from, you know, not knowing about you straight to marriage proposal, you're a creep, <laughs> right? And so you need to think about those, those relational steps. And so people who understand relationships and understand how to navigate those, generally are really good marketers, right? Because they actually understand, okay, what needs to happen? What does this person need to see? Maybe, right? Maybe it's, it's an actual personalized email that asks a question that begs a response or something like that. Maybe it's getting them from email and SMS into a VIP group, right? That's, you know, I've been a big proponent of VIP groups over the years and, and deepening the relationship that way. So it's not just a one to many channel, but it's a channel where they can talk back and forth. I mean, SMS can be that as well. I think that there's a really interesting thing when you move people into a VIP group and they can talk amongst themselves, that's where you really yeah. see brands absolutely explode. And I think everybody is trying to get to that point. I think obviously um, they are probably the, the front runners when it comes down to community, community, community. Um, yeah. And I, I do like, like that idea is build those brand loyalists and almost have them do some of the communication and outreach for you. I, I absolutely love that. Very, very good conversation. Um, one or two more questions for you then. I'm happy to move on to the next subject um, to tap, tap into your knowledge. Do you feel like, and this is the question on everybody's mind, of course, do you believe that AI, the machine learning, the robots will help us to control the, the messaging to our audiences? Or do you feel like it's a, eh, at current stage, I don't know, I think it still needs some human intervention. I think that the fact that we're, so, I mean, how many years into AI are we? Probably 20-ish years, something like that. Long, we're, long, long time, yeah. Yeah, we're, it's, it's interesting. My uncle has worked in AI for since like the early 2000s in AI development and has an incredible model that, that he showed me of sort of how systems learn, which has really helped me realize how humans learn. It's like, oh, this is so interesting. An AI system never actually has the answer. All it does is it's just moving little bits back and forth as it gets feedback, which is really interesting for perfectionists who think that, you know, we need to, to solve something all the time, right? When it's like, well, actually, you just need to take as many at bats. You know, we were talking about some of my recent failures and I'm like, are, are they? Because it's like, it's another wall that I came up against that if I take the feedback, this AI system is going to become just a little bit better, right? And you don't get that that system feedback without becoming better. So all of that being said, AI will become better than the best copywriter ever within the next year. 
Like, I don't think that there's a, I don't think that there's a question there. I don't think that there's a question of like, if you, if anyone saw the demo of ChatGPT 4.0 and the, the nuance of, of humor that the, uh, that the robot is able to have with you and how they're <laughs> able to like, actually like, think about this people on, um, with ASD, like on the spectrum have a very difficult time reading facial cues, right? The robot can read facial cues and know how you're feeling. That's wild. And so can it copyright? Absolutely. Is it there right now? Right now it needs it needs human intervention, basically at all times, yeah. because it does a lot of things that that tip off that it's the robot. <laughs> and but as far as like as far as a starting point, I think that it's brilliant as a starting point right now. And I would say getting you about 80% of the way there. Um I think the problem is just making sure that you are not leaning too heavily on it so that you don't know what good copy looks like. Um, I don't, I've never written a single uh, LinkedIn post, Twitter post, or newsletter with AI. Um, it doesn't make sense to me. I, I want to use my voice. And to me, that actually, that little bit makes a difference. In a year, that might change. I don't know. But... What an AI can't do is they can't replicate your experiences and your unique, your unique experience stack that you've had, right? That's where that's where humans are going to always win is all of the different things that you've done that other humans are going to glom onto, right? Like for 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 me in my experience, right? I uh, you know owned a restaurant at one point. I was a paramedic for twelve years. I've owned six different brands. I've owned an agency. I've owned Airbnbs and rentals and I've been close to bankruptcy at times and all of these different things that make a unique stack to be able to talk from and AI can't do that because it doesn't have experience. So anyway, sorry, another long winded answer. Uh, I, th I think you, you're absolutely nailing it. Um, I was in a recent chat with um, the guys over at Wild. So they are building a, again, a predictive analytics model that is trying to be better than Clavio's predictive analytics um, to mm, obviously yeah. determine when is the, the next purchase happening for that particular person. So I strike them at the right time. And it's such a black box that they, their messaging or angle of attack is Clavio's predictive analytics is Pandora's black box like you just don't know what the hell goes into it and when you go read at the, the documentation of that you can see of course it, it's all just patterns they're trying to simulate patterns off of certain data sets um, and that doesn't help because this particular guy that i've that i've had this, this chat with he, he pointed out that so some 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 d2c brand um handed over the the sticks to um, or the wheel to clavius predictive analytics and it ended up over messaging to people anyways, because it, the, the, the machine was confused on like, when should we target people to win them back? Like people ended up getting six, seven win back emails just because the system couldn't figure it out. Um, so you're right. I think it's always going to be there and it's a good starting point, but we'll never replace the human thinking psychology anyways. Uh, yeah. I like, May uh, the thing is, I'm not saying that we won't at some point. Maybe, like, maybe that's it, it's interesting. I've I'm oh, just about done better. the Elon it makes us better. Totally, I, I'm just about done the Elon biography right now, and for for him, he really believes that AI will never replace human consciousness, right? Whereas, like Larry Page at Google is like, that's being specious, you know, <laughs> and like as though AI is some species you don't want. It's like, well, I don't think that that's quite there, I, yeah. personally. But, but again, we could look back in twenty years and laugh at this. So, who knows? I'm with you. I'm with you. It's, it's it's exciting times. I mean, that's why we. Uh... Second topic, and I know you recently had a very interesting conversation around exactly this. Um, is loyalty programs, reward play programs, referral programs? The question I want to put out there, and I talk to. You know yourself as a you know e-commerce founder, agency guy. You talk to different you know SaaS companies, different solutions, options out there. The question I want to throw out to you is: 
are traditional loyalty programs dead? Because you've, you've kind of touched on community VIP stuff that leads us on to how do you treat these people with, you know, certain special treatment and so on. Are traditional loyalty programs dead? No, no, they aren't. Um, but I don't think that they're the top, right? So I don't think that they're, I don't think that they're necessarily dead. I just don't know if they actually drive incremental revenue for small D to C brands. That's the, that's the biggest issue that I have. Um, I would much rather see people um, going really deep with a smaller amount of customers. So something again, that we did at our baby clothing brand was we had the crew, right? So the crew was uh, people who got a certain amount of discount. Um, every single time that we had a drop, they would get to have the drop first. They would then make content for that drop. They were affiliates that could then uh, make money if somebody used their link um, or used their uh, their co-branded landing page. Um, if somebody went to their co-branded landing page, those are really important and very interesting, um, very interesting ways to create loyalty. So I, I would much rather you have a hundred raving fans than a thousand mediocre fans, right? Like that to me is much more important and something I'm always trying to think of as like, let's get people who are absolutely obsessed with you because they're gonna then spread the word. And you wanna know if you're doing this right or not is have your post-purchase survey and say where people found out about you. If it's not at least 40% word of mouth, you probably, number one, probably don't have a good product, right? But you may have a good product but number two, you may not have raving fans yet that are telling people. And so pouring into those people is incredibly important. Look like, don't just call people your VIPs, actually treat them like your VIPs. If they're your VIPs, send them out, like send them a gift card and be like, hey, I sent you a gift card. Can we hop on the phone and just like chat? I'd like love to hear like what you think about what we're doing. Those are things that get me a lot more excited. Love that. I was on a recent, just to, just to back up your statement there, um, funny enough, exactly like you jumped on a, a demo call with a, a person that has a loyalty program software. Um, this is more on the AI side. He showed me numbers yeah. of a, a D2C brand where, so what they do is they, they stream the Shopify data through the platform and then they basically break people into different cohorts. And the loyalty yeah. cohort the LTV, because a lot of people, they look at LTV and they go, LTV is $500. Cool. It's like, no, 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 $500. You need to break it down by cohorts. So he showed yes. me in the yes, graph very that important. The, loyal, the loyalty group was at like $500 LTV. The rest was sitting at ninety eighty five, And then also the loyalty group uh, contributed to 45% of the entire revenue. Um, so that's very interesting. So you saying like treating them different, like really don't just say you'll get, you know, early access, actually do that. Jump on the phone. That is, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Treat, just treat them like a VIP, you know? So in saying that this entire tiered system, um, like automating loyalty programs, if you hit a certain tier, an email goes off, Hey, you now part of the, the silver tier. Do you reckon that is BS? Or do you reckon there is still a space for, let's bake that into the system so if people hit certain tiers, because of course you want to scale your loyalty program. Um, do you feel like yes. parts of that is broken and needs some rethinking? I think that again, it's a matter of, it's what we talked about at the beginning, right? And it's, it's really thinking about knowing your customer really well. If you're your avatar that you're selling to, it really makes it a lot easier. Like, hey, well, what do I want exactly, right? How do I want to be communicated to? How do I want to, do I want to be automatically enrolled in this? Probably not. You know, for me, I, I want to be able to have some autonomy and some choice, which is again, why I don't love the idea of like retention.com because I want to have that choice, right? I don't want you to suddenly subscribe me to an email series that I'm not a part of. And yeah. so I think that that's really, I think that's what it comes down to. Um, do I think that you should just cut your loyalty program? No, but look at it and measure the incrementality of your loyalty program. Is it actually driving incremental new revenue? And if it's not, maybe rethink that, right? And rethink how it's going to be. If it's going to take you away from pouring into your VIPs, your actual VIPs, don't do it. Um, that is my recommendation. 
I love that. You're talking about incremental growth. Have you ever done a, a holdout test where for some VIP buyers, you have treated them with whatever incentive versus a group where you haven't given them the same treatment? Like how do not. you actually measure you haven't, you know, I have not, I have not done that. I think that you could do that. I think that there's some platforms out there. I, I really like Toki for loyalty. Um, I think that's one of the platforms that you can do some holdout work on. So definitely recommend checking that one out. Um, but yeah, no, I have, I have never personally done that holdout before. I wish I could have told you yes. No, no it's, it's just, I'm just asking because I know a lot of people do struggle. How do you actually measure, measure the incremental, you know, lift? Uh, very much like, you know, you know, uh, you know, email attribution, like when is it really the email driving that versus the totally. customer um, would have bought from you anyways? It's, it's always a struggle, we know. <laughs> yes, yes, totally. Yes. I love that. Very cool. Listen, man, thank you so much for bringing your insights to the table. I think we've had some good conversations around over messaging. I think my takeaway is that don't be scared to send a lot of emails. Um, and it, it, it kind of opens my eyes as well, because I tend to be on the side where, okay, stop sending so many emails, stop it. Uh, but I'm not that customer. Um, so I love the fact that you, you, you kind of kicked it off as don't be scared to send emails because that's also a problem. Um, and then loyalty yeah. programs love the fact that you, like you say, make it personal, really make it care about it. Don't just plonk some, out of the box off the shelf program onto your your loyalists and you know thinking that that's going to make the magic for you totally yeah well thanks so much for having me on this is a this is absolutely. a blast and i i hope this brought some value to people absolutely I appreciate it how can people stay in touch with you you do a bit of a plug here because who doesn't want to be connected with you come on <laughs> Well, you can listen to my podcast, Secrets to Scaling Your E-Commerce Brand. We're on all major platforms. Um, Spotify is a great place to listen to us. Um, and then you can reach out to me. Uh, agency is Upgrowth Commerce, upgrowthcommerce.com. Uh, and then I am very active on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, that's where I spend most of my kind of social time um, is uh, over there. So if you just search Jordan West uh, in those Do places, it. you'll find me. I love it. And your mountain biking, when's the next event? When can people join on the next ride? <laughs> Ah, <laughs> well, I'm hoping my bike is going to be fixed today. So I had to take it in for a big service and I'm, it's been gone for two weeks. So I'm kind of itching right now. You know what? That is exactly why I'm not mountain biking is because it's constantly either has a flat wheel or there's some chain that has broken. So mine is always, you know, out of service anyway. <laughs> I love it. It's worth Thanks, it. Brother. Thanks for the time. It. And it's, it's, worth, it's still worth it. It's still worth it. Um, appreciate you. And once again, thanks for everything you're doing for the community. We, we appreciate it. Absolutely. All right. See you later. Cheers, man. All the best. Bye-bye.